What I would like to do this morning is, uh, first of all, steal a good chunk of the thunder of uh, everyone else that's going to be on the program today. I'd like to give you just a bit of a general overview on, on the topic of how to, how to build a good road. And I don't want to uh, try and uh, teach a whole course in uh, highway engineering here. And if there's anything that I leave you with today, it's a feeling that there's an overall concern for safety associated with what it is that we do in terms of road engineering. There are four primary concerns or considerations in, in road design, road building, road maintenance, road engineering in general. One of them is a concern for capacity, which for those of you from the rural areas are going to find is not too, too great a problem, and I'll show you why in a minute. The geometrics or the design, both in terms of vertical alignment and horizontal alignment, are extremely important and can make the difference between whether a road is safe or not. And there are some associated aspects of geometrics that we'll talk about as well. The film that we just saw made the point that drainage is extremely important. I remember a saying from many years ago that the three most important aspects of road engineering are drainage, drainage, and drainage. And I think uh, I don't want to steal the thunder of the people that are following me, but we're going to talk just a little bit about how that relates to successful road uh, design. And then finally, the surface. And by pavements, I don't limit myself excuse me, Bob, uh, Bob Jubaris from the Asphalt Institute. I don't limit myself to blacktop and Portland cement concrete. I think of pavement for low volume roads as also including good gravel as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, pavements. Uh, by the time we get done, if there's anything for everybody else to talk about, uh, I don't know what it'll be. They can all say it again. Uh, the concern for safety is, is kind of a curiosity. I did a survey, a nationwide survey, of what are the critical issues uh, that local roads officials perceive around the United States a year ago. And it was interesting that not one official came back saying that highway safety was a critical issue. I don't think that means that, that local roads officials aren't concerned with safety. I think what it means is that they see, see, see safety as an important integral part of all road engineering. And I, I want you to note, though, that the gates are open there, and there's always room for a few more. And we don't want to, uh, we don't want to enhance this uh, too much by the way in which we uh, build it. There's a drop, but we won't worry about it. We'll just keep on going. Now, there are ways in which we can uh, improve upon uh, the design and the capacity of a road. Eliminating uh, slow speed curves, for example, is, uh, is one of the uh, considerations that uh, would improve upon the capacity. And let's talk in terms of design standards. And I'm sorry, uh, uh, I must apologize for this slide. It didn't reproduce as well as I hoped it would. Uh, and let's define what we're talking about here in terms of, uh, of various types of highways. Uh, I think the slide that did drop was the slide that said we were shifting gears from talking capacity to talking geometrics. Uh, anyway, in terms of design standard, we're probably talking anywhere, let's say, 16 to 20 uh, feet uh, in terms of a paved uh, or central surface, with maybe uh, desirably five uh, foot shoulders, maybe uh, anywhere in the range of four to eight alongside the road. It would be nice if we had a right-of-way that was uh, on the order of four rods or so, but uh, seldom is that always uh, available. The point is that you need some space alongside the road for ditches. Now, in terms of the elements of design, and I don't want to belabor this, let me just uh, uh, quickly run over the categories. I realize that it may be a little difficult uh, in the back to see all these different things. The thing I want you to understand is that there are some prescribed standards for the design of a road. And those are prescribed in terms of beginning in terms of the design speed. What speed do you wish to be able to attend, attain on the road? And then as a function of that, the stopping distance increases with speed. The uh, passing site distance or passing distance increases with design speed. There are other considerations. For example, the minimum curve radius, and, a function of, and that would be a function of the cross-sectional super elevation. The maximum grade that we would like to have, uh, we try to avoid zero grades for drainage purposes. And the, all of these kinds of things are available in design standards, which are published by agencies such as the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. 
One question that I was going to ask earlier, and I think uh, it would be good to ask it anyway, how many of you have in your offices, on your desk, use every now and then, any of the design standards of the American Association of State Highway Officials? Can I see a show of hands there? One, two, three that I see. How many of you have a book called The Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices? Aha, uh -huh, a few more there. How much cross-section and slope you need is a function of what is paved with, but typically we need an eighth to a quarter of an inch per foot for asphalt concrete. Uh, gravel would need quite a bit more, uh, anywhere from a half to three quarters of an inch per foot. And uh, turf shoulders, for example, need to be sloped quite a bit in order to get good drainage. Here's an example of a road that uh, looks pretty good. It's signed, it's got drainage ditches, it's got a reasonably smooth surface that you could travel down without too much problem, mowed, mowed shoulders and so on. Perhaps if there's any problem with this road at all, it's the fact that the crown, the cross-sectional crown, is a little bit too flat, and that will lead to problems of deterioration in the springtime. Another geometric consideration and I'm going to make the contrast between this as perhaps a good bad example. Here's a relatively narrow bridge. Uh, my son uh, is standing in front of the, uh, the uh, bridge uh, parapet there, not at all well marked. On a dark night, somebody could, with that curve right there, could wind up being guided right into that uh, bridge uh, headwall, and it would stop him pretty fast. The use of guide rail is another aspect of geometric design. Sometimes it's really warranted to do so, where you have a big drop off on the side of the road, as is the case here. And notice, this is a gravel surfaced road. There's no, no prescription that says you can only use guide rail on a paved road. Center line striping is another consideration. And, and believe it or not, and this comes directly out of the standards of the American Association of State Highway Officials, there are some circumstances under which the recommendation is don't put a line down the middle of the road. If you know these things, and if there is a problem, and you get hauled into court, or you have an irate uh, property owner that comes in, and you can reach over on the side of your desk and pat on a book or open it up to the right place and show them that, in fact, the recommended standard is to not put a center line stripe down the road, it's really handy to know that kind of thing. Now there are circumstances in that table where you should have a stripe down the road. This is uh, one of them. Uh, fairly good design, paved shoulders, perfectly wide road, but no stripe. Not good. You don't want, you, you need to be aware of the standards so that if something bad happens on this road, uh, you can avoid uh, winding up having egg on your face if you do have to go to court. This is a pretty good example of one where the lanes aren't too terribly wide, but the traffic levels warrant uh, putting the stripe on the road. And I don't know how well you can see this in the back, but here's one that I really hate to see. If you look carefully in this shadow, you can kind of pick up the fact that there's a double, no passing stripe in this road right here. If you ever want to wind up really having egg on your face in court, it's a situation where you have a center line stripe, but you fail to maintain it. There's no way in hell that anybody on a wet night could see that this is a recommended no passing zone because the, the paint line has been allowed to deteriorate too badly. And so what happens here, somebody pulls out to pass, somebody comes over that crest, there's a head-on collision, maybe nobody is killed but they get seriously injured and you wind up in court. So when you do put down stripes, then it's incumbent upon you to maintain Let's go on to the topic of drainage. I hope that I leave you a little bit frustrated because my intent here is not to, as I say, give a complete course on these things, but simply to uh, kind of give you an overview. Note the sign, weight limit two tons. I'm not sure I could legally drive across that bridge with that Jeep. Um, and there, there's many, many of these around the country. They're not just in Vermont, they're not just in New York, they're all over the United States. The numbers are very large. At the federal level, there is a great deal of publicity right now about the problems of deteriorating infrastructure, the problems of deteriorating bridges and deteriorating highways. Let's not kid ourselves. We are not going to be able to afford to replace the 175,000 deficient bridges in the United States. We're going to have to bite the bullet and close some of these bridges 
and generate in the process some circuitry of travel for a few folks. But we're not doing them any favors in many respects to leave that bridge open because sooner or later some jockey on a fuel oil truck who wants to save himself five minutes of travel time is going to go across there and you know what's going to happen. He's going to wind up in the drink. So. Um, I think we need to recognize that from a policy point of view, we really can't afford to replace all of the deficient bridges in the country. <laughs> now we talk drainage. Many people think of culverts and bridges and things like that when we talk drainage, but there's another kind of a drainage that's very, very critical, and that's road surface drainage. Water is bad for the people and the, and the pavements, people driving on the roads and the pavements. On the pavement, it can sit, if it can sit on the uh, surface in ruts and puddles, it will cause hydroplaning, which is dangerous at high speed. It can freeze, which of course causes skidding. Worse yet, as it circulates beneath the pavement by trickling in, it can soften clay bases, it can freeze to cause frost heaves, and if there's anything that you uh, carry away today, it's one of the key features of successful road building is to have good drainage. It's bad for the pavement. Sometimes you call these things frost boils, eh? Um, you see the water standing on the shoulder of the road. In fact, the shoulder of the road used to be over here, but gradually over the years, the road has deteriorated to the point where there's only a little bit left in the middle here. Unfortunately, we have altogether too many pavements in this kind of condition in the Northeast. There are three aspects that you need to have that kind of a situation occur for frost heat. You need to have prolonged freezing weather. We're very fortunate in the Northeast in that we do have prolonged freezing weather. <laughs> you need frost susceptible soils. We've been uh, helped by Mother Nature. She slid some glaciers over us, ground all that rock up into a flower called silt, and we have frost susceptible soils everywhere. You need water. All, all over the Northeast, we seem to be in a humid uh, climate except this summer, uh, and there's abundant water 10, 15, 20 feet below the surface. But if we can get rid of any one of these three, frost heave will be no problem. If we can get rid of the water, if we can get rid of the frost susceptible soil, there isn't much we can do about the weather, but we can work on those two, and of the two, the one that I think we can do the most with easily is to get the water off the surface of the road. We drop to aggregate roads. This is a springtime aggregate surface road, pretty good road building material, but look at all those little potty critters there. Some people call them chuck holes, some people call them a pain in the neck, but uh, there's clearly a maintenance problem here. We did some research a few years ago and uh, came up with something kind of interesting as to what causes those kind of problems. Now I'm going to get a little technical for a second here. Cross slope, this is in terms of foot per foot, but a hundredth of a foot per foot is about an eighth of an inch per foot. So here's an eighth, a quarter, three eighths, a half, and so on on the aggregate surface to the road. This is the cross slope. This is the longitudinal grade. 1% grade, 2% grade, 3% grade, 4% grade. If you'll notice, down here in the lower corner of the diagram, we have a severe problem of pothole, or a definite problem of pothole severity as a function of what kind of a cross slope and what kind of a longitudinal slope we have. If we can crown the road, get out here beyond 3 eighths of an inch per foot, and you remember from a slide a while back the recommendation was a half an inch per foot at least, or beyond this out here, the, the problem drops off to a trace, and then finally we're in the range of trace to none, and if you get way out here, four, four or five eighths of an inch uh, per foot, half an inch or more per foot of cross slope or beyond 4% longitudinal slope, there's no problem of that pothole in that you saw in the previous slide, this sort of thing. It goes away. So maintaining the cross slope is very important. Now you might say, okay, where I've got longitudinal slope, I don't have to worry about cross slope. Well, you do and you don't. What that slide doesn't show is that if you have no cross slope, but you do have longitudinal slope, you're going to get problems of rutting in the, uh, in the wheel paths. So you still need the cross slope, the crown, on an area surface road to 
despite what the longitudinal grade is, to shove that water off to the side of the road. If you do that, you won't have problems like this, and you won't have little chuck holes like you saw in the preceding slide. You can maintain that cross section. Now you can have too much drainage. This road serves as an example. It doesn't look too bad here. In fact, it looks pretty doggone good here. It's a fairly narrow shoulder. Couldn't hardly park on it. What you can't really tell is how deep that ditch is there. Somebody got themselves a brand new grade all, and they decided they were going to go out there and ream that ditch. And so they did. A few days later, <laughs> Somebody, in fact, I think that was a local uh, uh, septic tank uh, contractor. I don't know whether he turned his head to look at a bird or what, but as he was going down the road, one wheel of that tractor got off the side. Before I could get down to my office and back with a camera, the only thing I could see when I went by there was this one big wheel sticking up horizontally. And the whole tractor was swallowed in the ditch. Before I could get back, they had brought this cherry picker out. And if you look carefully, there's a cable holding that up. And if you look at it from the back side, you can see how very far down in there they were, clear down there. And now they've got the hydraulics on and trying to push the darn thing out of the ditch. Well, it's not still there, so obviously they got it out. The problem that I'm trying to point out here is you do want drainage, but for heaven's sakes, don't put in a four-foot ditch when all you need is a one-foot ditch. The last item on the list is pavements. Why do we put pavements down? So that they will cause lots of problems for the highway department. We didn't have pavements. Just think of how much of your life would be pleasanter. Wouldn't have to plow snow, just roll it. Good old days. Well, there is a purpose for pavements. Primary purpose is to distribute surface loads over otherwise weak or seasonally weak subgrade soil. We put pavements down to prevent or reduce infiltration of surface water. Again, to maintain the all-weather feature of the road and to provide a smooth riding all-weather surface. These guys are what we design pavements for. The automobile behind is like a pimple on the nose of an elephant by comparison to the stresses that are created by this guy right here. Uh, big, heavy trucks cause essentially all of the fatigue damage to a road. Have you, any of you ever sat absentmindedly, bent a paper clip back and forth in your hands? You know what happens. Show of hands. It's good to exercise the arms. How many of you ever bent a paper clip back and forth? I better ask the other question. How many of you have never bent a paper clip back and forth? Okay. You've done it. Now you can bend that dude back and forth three or four times, fold it back into position, clip it onto your papers, and everything's copacetic. You do it another two or three times, open it up and close it, suddenly you've got two halves of a paper clip in your hands, and it has ceased to be able to perform its function. The same thing is true with road surfaces. One, we don't want to design a pavement that can only support one pass of this truck. That would be extremely embarrassing. But repeated loading, just like clipping that paper clip back and forth, you can do it a few times, 10, 1,000, a million, whatever, depends on how big you deflect it. Little tiny deflections on the paper clip, you could go for a long time, beyond your patience, before you would break it in half. Great big deflections on the paper clip. You do it three or four or five times and you got two halves. Same sort of thing here. That guy right there, that little automobile, is putting such a small deflection or such a small stress into the pavement that as far as the pavement is concerned, it's, it doesn't even know the automobile is there. But this truck puts a great big deflection into the pavement and you can't do it too many times before you wind up with a crack in the wheel path, as you see right there in the foreground. So you have to design pavements so that they can support these kinds of loads, or these kinds of loads. Believe me, the folks that own these kind of trucks know what the law is, and they push it right up to the edge. And don't overlook these little guys. Just a little school bus, nothing but a whole bunch of 80-pound kids in it, doesn't matter. Rot. Notice that all that load's distributed over just a couple of wheels. But on the concrete truck and, and so on, you've got a lot more wheels. So it does make a difference. The principle here is to try and provide a sufficiently adequately strong base over the subgrade or basement soil so that the stress is dissipated. And you don't want to use a weak base material or you will deform it. 
and you'll see a heaving in the surface. That's evidence of either it can, the failure can occur down in the subgrade or it can occur up in the base. But the principle is to transmit the tire load away from the stresses of the tire load, away from the subgrade. Now, the interlock between particles is one of the principal sources of strength. And generally speaking, for base course materials, you want to be sure you have enough little guys in between the big guys so that the big guys can't roll around, so that they can get uh, good strength. One problem is clay. When you have clay, it's a platy particle. And if you've ever tried to walk around with a big stack of books, those are platy particles too. You have to push real hard together to get any strength to be able to support a column of books on its side, for example. The same thing is true here, except imagine that as we add water, it, it provides a lubricating film, which changes the cohesion between the particles and makes them weak. And that's why we say that water is the enemy of base coarse materials. That's why specifications for gravels to go into roads usually always recommend that if you're going to put some kind of an impervious surface over the top, a seal coat, asphalt, whatever it might be, that you want to have less than 10% of the material passing the number 200 sieve. Less than 10% finer than 74 microns. Less than 10% in the silt and clay size particle range. And the reason for that is so as it does get moist, we won't have this problem of smooth, slippery grains sliding on one another. For lower volume roads, typically we tend to use bituminous surface treatments, where we have an asphaltic binder with a crushed one size aggregate. We uh, will sometimes use a stabilized uh, gravel or a stabilized base, stabilize it either with the dust palliative or with asphalt mixed in place. These are dust palliatives, although they tend to do a little bit of cementing, the chlorides, or perhaps cement, excuse me, cement or lime fly ash, uh, and usually to provide abrasion resistance, we would put a surface treatment on top of these kinds of stabilized materials. We even, to some extent, use unstabilized gravels. Crushed angular particles would be desirable. Clean would be desirable. Durable would be desirable. Durable? Well, the absence of shale, for one thing, would be uh, in order to keep the shale out if possible. When you see this kind of a situation, here's an aggregate road, car going down the hill. You've got two things that you ought to see right there. I guess the thing I'd like you to see first is the lack of safety. Heaven help the guy that's coming down the road behind this car and decides he wants to pass because he doesn't have the slightest idea whether there's somebody coming on or not. Despite how, you know, there's tremendous sight distance there. You can see forever, but you can't see around the car as you come up behind it. You wouldn't even know there was one there unless I told you it was there. So that's one thing you should see. I guess your pocketbook should twitch just a little bit too when you look at that slide because what you see when you see all that cloud of dust is the road blowing away. And as the fine binder material goes away, then that releases the sand particles, and they wind up on the side of the road. As the sand particles go away, that releases the pea gravel, and it winds up in a berm on the side of the road. And eventually, you get the large particles in a berm over on the side of the road. That interferes with your cross-slope drainage, so that the water now is going down the road instead of over into the shoulder. You built it right to begin with, but over a period of time with traffic and with the dust coming up, two things, safety problems and economic problems, come into play. How do you compensate for that? You either blade frequently or you apply some kind of a dust palliative to hold that down. If you have a road that looks like this, you don't need a PhD in civil engineering to know that this is a road that's uh, settled and it's, uh, it's seen as day. And to come along here and just put another surface treatment on might very well be throwing uh, good money after bad. The symptoms of the disease are on the surface, but the disease itself is down in the road base. And we really need to come in here, remove the frost susceptible base material, or augment it by busting up the old seal coat and putting in new base to adequately support that surface treatment. Because all of this alligator cracking that you see right here comes for the same reason that the paper clip breaks apart due to repeated flexure of ultimately causing a crack. And then subcracks, this is a main crack right there, subcracks formed. Ultimately, all of this area in here will have cracks and will look like these areas right here. By the time it gets this bad, a tire ultimately pops one of these chunks out and some water sits in there. Before too long, the fines uh, get pushed out and the chunks around it go away and you have something that looks like this, a great big pothole. 
I, I've talked a little bit about the basic principles of road engineering. I have a feeling that some of you might very well be sitting in your chair thinking, boy, all that Irwin has just said is going to cost me money. And um, how many of you are sitting there thinking that right now? <laughs> One or two? Some of you are more honest than others. How many of you would buy off on the concept, uh, gee, if my uh, local governing body would give me the kind of money that it takes to do this sort of thing, I would be happy, I'd be sitting pretty, and everything, and my road system would look great. How many? Two hands from some people. Okay. If I just had the money, everything would be great. Okay. I, I want to, uh, if I go away accomplishing anything, I guess I want to go away leaving you a little bit uncomfortable with that kind of uh, thinking. So now if we can turn the lights off, I'm going to uh, tell you something about that problem. We have become conditioned, we, I'm speaking not just of us that are in the technical side of road building and the policy making side of road building, but the public in general, because we're part of that group as well. The public in general has come to accept that this is what a road is going to look like before it's rehabilitated. That they don't expect to see a highway crew come out here until it's this bad or maybe even a little bit worse before uh, anybody is going to come along and fix that road. And then ultimately, first they come by and they do some patching. Here's a pretty good example of that. You'll notice uh, there's at least three generations of patches here. There's some real light gray, then there's some not quite so light gray, and then there's some that was just recently done. I, I have to chuckle at this. How did the guy that was out here doing this patching decide to place his blacktop here, but not here? Talk about a series of patches in search of a road, that's, that's got to be it. The quality of a road is measured vertically on this scale by its roughness and, uh, or its cost to operate on. Starts out when we've just rebuilt it in uh, good condition. And then gradually over a period of time, and this is schematic, this says five years, 15 years, and so on. Uh, that could be 10 years to this point for a town road and 20 years for an interstate highway. So take this with a grain of salt. This is a, uh, uh, just to show you the relationship between quality and time. Notice the orange line. Comes down, keeps on going down, starts going down slow to begin with, and speeds up over a period of time. Now there's some point where driving on this road gets so bad that the public won't stand for it any longer. And so we come out and we reconstruct the road, put it back up into good condition, and it starts to cycle all over again. Um, this is a fundamental principle. But in that movie that was shown this morning, it was mentioned that if you will catch a road and rehabilitate it right here as it goes from good to fair, a structural overlay, a couple inches of blacktop, will put it right back into good condition. It can start to deteriorate again, but it doesn't cost very much to do that by comparison with waiting till it gets down here where it's badly potholed, all broken up, the public is all angry, public relations have gone to hell in a handbasket, and now it's gonna cost 10 times as much to rehabilitate that road as it does if you catch it in a timely fashion. And that 10 times is not due to inflation over that five year period. It's due to deterioration of the surface to where the only alternative becomes dig it up and throw it away and start over again. And if we could recognize the significance of this, we could make highway dollars stretch an awful lot further. So that the point, if I only had the money, I could do the job, would become a, a comment of the past, I think. Get out there, correct the drainage problems, do good geometrics, sign the bridges, design the roads for the loads rather than lamenting the fact the trucks are too heavy. Remember that safety is an important consideration and none of us want to wind up in this place. Recognize that it's possible to get good drainage, good roads, good signing, and keep the public happy. And so as the sun slowly sinks into the west, let's turn on the lights and leave room for the next speaker. Thank you for your attention.